Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, almost 20 after one. Today is Wednesday, April the 7th. I'm Martin Gagel with Radius Research. Today, we're very happy to have Don Blundell, CEO, founder, and director of NanoWind Technologies, NNO on the Venture Exchange. Dan has a history of working with some great high-tech companies, including Creo and Kodak, as well as working with some fascinating technologies, material handling, medical devices, industrial printing, material science, and nuclear fusion. Firstly, for those of you that don't know the NanoWind story, Dan will give us a brief overview on the company, and then we'll get into some of the details on the technology and the development of the business. Dan, thank you very much for joining us today. Great. It's great to be here, Martin. Thank you for having me on the webcast. All right. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, just for those who don't know the story, go do a little bit of a history and where are you at right now? Yeah. Okay. So, so Nano One is a technology company. Uh, we're developing industrial technology for the production of lithium ion battery cathode materials. To give everyone a sense what that is, um, inside a lithium ion battery, um, there's a positive and negative electrode and the cathode materials are one of the electrodes and it's comprised of uh, materials like lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, uh, there can be aluminum, zirconium, a whole bunch of mixture of different materials. That black powder, that, that black material is a powder, it looks like coffee grounds. Every grain of, uh, of that powder um, is, uh, is, uh, is a crystalline uh, ceramic material. And that's what allows lithium to go in and out as you charge and discharge the battery. So we have technology to make these cathode powders and we do it in a way that, uh, that reduces cost, improves the performance, and uh, eliminates a uh, substantial part of the sort of carbon footprint and energy input uh, into the supply chain. All right, okay. Part of your, your core, I guess, platform technology is you call it your one pot uh, process. That's it, correct. Could you, uh, like, you, you showed it to me once like four or five years ago and it was like a beaker you are mixing the stuff together. Uh, like I'm no scientist. It didn't look like so you're just, can you just sort of explain layman's terms? Like what does that mean? Or like you've got a bunch of the technology patented and I'm sure some just proprietary uh, process information yourself, but kind of explain what that means. Well, I, I guess it's, it, what probably it's important for everyone to know is, is we call it a one pot process because the way cathode materials are made today is more like uh, there's four different stages that go into making the materials. So, so we're really combining um, four things into one and that's why it's called a one pot process. And, and, and maybe to give that context, um, uh, the first thing that happens is that is the metals are pulled out of the ground by miners and then and then converted into a useful metal, um, be it uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt metal, or lithium carbonate or something like that. And those, but those really aren't battery ready until they're converted into uh, it, traditionally in the industry until they're converted into a sulfate or a hydroxide. Then they go off to a battery producer who then mixes them all together and uh, to make a uh, to make intermediate materials. So they'll combine the nickel, manganese, and cobalt first. And then that goes off to a cathode producer, then mixes in the lithium. And then once they've got all that mixed and, and made into a powder, then they, uh, they add a coating on the, uh, in the last step. So there's many stages in the process. What the one pot process does is we do the conversion of the metals. We do the conversion of the lithium carbonate and we uh, do the coating materials all in one reactor. So literally it's, a, it's a, an aqueous reactor, it's water-based. All the, all the raw materials go in, we convert them all into a mixed metal composite powder, which then goes into the final stage of, it's a furnace. Uh, and and the, the furnace is the same for the incumbent process that it is for ours. It's a big long pizza oven and you fill trays with these powders and you push them through the furnace until they're cooked. And um, we are able to make this composite material that when it goes through the first, it forms these, uh, these readily made crystals with the lithium already impregnated in it and with the coating already um, uh, around each one of the sort of grains of powder. So the one pot process allows us really to do all these step, steps at once, the conversion, the, the metal conversion process, the lithium uh, carbonate conversion process, the lithiation of the, of the materials and the carbon coating all in one stage. And that's, uh, that's really the sort of genesis of the, of the name and, and why it's important because it, it reduces cost. Um, if you get rid of the sulfate process, you get rid of a, a big sort of energy and uh, carbon footprint and cost associated with, the, with these uh, intermediate converters because you take them out of the supply chain and you remove uh, a, a series of, of, um, 
of margin steps and costs and and uh, shipping and environmental concerns uh, that are all kind of associated with that. Okay, so normally with a technology or any kind of like your system set, like it's faster, or I don't know if it's fat. Well, there's less in the furnace. It, it's cheaper. It's greener. Like, are there trade offs in it in in any sense? Because it sounds like it's just positive, positive, positive. Is it the, the trade off that you get some margin out of the whole process and and that, or is there any um, trade off that the uh, well, that... L- 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 you know, I suppose there's always trade offs. Um, um, uh, it, it all sounds very great the way you described it. I mean, our challenge is that we're disrupting the supply chain, so we're we're changing the way cathode materials are made. And that means uh, in order to do that, you've got to get kind of buying up and down the supply chain to do it. So it's a long sales cycle. And um, we're actively working, not just with cathode producers to to validate our technology, test it, prove out the economics. We're also working up and downstream of them with the miners. Yeah, who are very the miners are very interested in seeing this change in the supply chain because it creates more value for their for their nickel metal or their lithium carbonate. They don't have to send it to a converter. Um, and sort of give up their premium to give it to this middleman who can converts it into something that's useful for the battery. Um, so it creates more value for the upstream product for the miners, and it also, of course, um, helps the uh, helps the supply chain in favor of the of the downstream OEMs, the automotive uh, manufacturers, the consumer electronics manufacturers, who can who can uh, it'll simplify the supply chain, lower the cost, and green their uh, green the supply chain. So getting the buy-in from both ends of those things are really important. So, but it involves a you know it's a fairly long sales cycle, as a lot of testing, a lot of validation that you have to go through um, uh, in order to get there. So um, it, it's not, despite all the apparent benefits, it's, it's not easy to change that supply chain, but we are, uh, we are actively putting the partnerships in place to do that. So, because th- there's been a lot of news in the past of exploding Samsung phones and Teslas that catch on fire and so forth. Yeah. So like the industry is very risk averse. They can't afford to roll out a, a million uh, widgets and then have some technical issues. And, and you've, you've got to get the whole supply chain and process. What are all the like the steps and rolling it out, are they going to do like small batches do like for a couple years cars, like a thousand cars that are running it to test it or can they do enough testing within the sort of laboratory uh, environment where they get it uh, to a point where they're confident enough to roll it out on the new Volkswagen e-golf or, or whatever. Right. So it's a, it's a great point. I mean, you're never likely to go from zero to hero um, in any kind of a manufacturing process. It goes through stages. It looked lithium ion batteries that are in cars today started off in you know cameras and then went to phones and went to tablets. And, and that all that manufacturing technology um, slowly moved its way into larger scale batteries. I mean, really until, I mean, even today, the bulk of lithium ion batteries that are going into electric vehicles are based on manufacturing techniques and and uh, uh, battery pack systems that were uh, designed based on on how we we use lithium ion batteries and phones. We're starting to finally see an evolution in the in the supply chain where the the auto man- manufacturers are starting to redesign the packs so they become part of the frame of the car. Um, and they become, uh, and so in, in doing so, they're having to change the cells. They have to change the, the, the underlying sort of chemistry. And the, um, in order to favor lighter, denser, longer, you know, longer lasting batteries and, and to, to bring more value to the consumer, more value to the industrial user. Um, and, and it strays a little bit from your question, but, but um, the point is that, that um, all sort of chemistries and batteries go through a series of steps that start with smaller applications that are probably, you know, maybe a little less brand sensitive. Um, and, uh, and then as they prove themselves out and the volumes pick up and the price comes down, then they become more and more applicable to, uh, to large scale manufacturing for uh, something like an automotive application. In our case, we're, we're making a, a cathode material that's still based on lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. We're not asking anyone to change the chemistry of the battery. We just have a, we just have a, a less expensive way of making the material. So really that path to a full-scale battery uh, is probably a lot closer than having to reinvent the battery. So we're, you know, we, we're not in the business of reinventing a brand new battery that we're going to have to prove that the world works. Uh, the batteries already work. It's just that the you know, the the method to make the materials um, that, that work in them has changed, and that that we believe that's a faster path to commercialization and a faster path to uh, to large scale manufacturing as well. 
you, you mentioned how the car companies are still using packaging and systems that are from like older technology. Are they doing it that because it's just a sort of a risk aversion thing? They know that system works and before they start messing with packaging or the chemistry, they really want to be careful because they all, especially the Tesla of the world, seem to pride themselves on their innovativeness and progression. Well, listen, I mean, so even if you take Tesla as, a, as, a, as an example, so, so Tesla um, probably have tested more chemistries and more battery configurations than anyone else in the world and, you know, trying to find the thing that worked best for them. But at the end of the day, they picked an off-the-shelf design um, for their battery cell, which is a cylindrical cell about the you know, size of your thumb, and then put 7,000 of these things into a big battery pack and, and, uh, and built all the packaging to go around it. So that's the sort of initial incarnation of the battery. And really until uh, September of this last year, Tesla Battery Day, uh, that's how they built battery packs. Now they're talking about um, using the can, and they're, they're trying to, now they're making their, their, their batteries the size of a beer can or, or a coffee mug. And, and then they're planning to go to a battery pack that has a much bigger cell. And, uh, and then they kind of, uh, they basically, glue them all together along the edges of the cylinders to make this kind of a honeycomb structure that allows them to then integrate it into the uh, into the frame of the car so even though tesla prides themselves on innovating in the space they still aren't at the stage right now where they their cell has been designed um uh, or it, it is in a brand new packaging format that forms the uh, sort of the, the 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 foundation of the car look our, our phones went there years ago you know, uh, 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 you know, the battery is made thin and it's integral with the with the phone itself so that um, it's light and portable. Um, electric vehicles are just going there. So Tesla announced that at a Tesla battery day. BYD started doing this in China and are already manufacturing cells that are integrated into the frame of the vehicle. Um, and, and that helps lighten the vehicle and helps them pack more energy between the wheels. And so they get higher energy density and longer range. And that's the way all the, that's the, way all the electric vehicle uh, manufacturers are going to have to go. Um, so we've seen that trend from BYD. Uh, Tesla had a really fine response in, uh, in September, but they're still two to three years away from, uh, from manufacturing that. And I think all the other car manufacturers are going to go that direction as well. Okay, you, your technology at Supply, there, there are many different lithium battery types. And a lot of people don't know that. You have some technology on the NMC, the LNMO, the high voltage spinal stuff, and then the LFP. Could you just, like, there's no, um, I guess some people say, oh, which battery is going to be the winner? What technology? And, I, and we've discussed this before. Like, there's different, like, sort of horses for different races. Like, can you yeah. just talk about the different battery chemistries and the, what good they are for different solutions and where you see maybe the auto industry or the, the phone industry going in different directions on that? Yeah, I mean, look, you can take go even broader than lithium ion batteries. I mean, there's, 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 you know, lead acid batteries and there's, there's uh, uh, alkaline, you know, single use batteries. Um, and there are a variety of other types of batteries beyond lithium ion called lithium sulfur and lithium air, and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And they all address different um, uh, sort of market needs, but the the lithium ion batteries specifically are what you mentioned: LFP, LNMO, or, or, or high voltage spinel, and the and the NMC batteries. And each one of those those three materials uh, that I just mentioned, they all three of them have different crystal structures, which means that the the nickel in the NMC you've got nickel, manganese, and cobalt atoms all kind of lined up into a layer with lithium with lithium in between, and another layer and another layer. So it's this sandwich of of uh, of, uh, of atoms um, that form these crystal structures. That's actually the that's that's one of the densest ways you can pack lithium in. So it's a very energy dense material. There's a lot of lithium in there, um, but you can't take all the lithium out. If you take all the lithium out from between the layers, the layers collapse. And, uh, and then you can't get the lithium back in. So, the, um, uh, so you have to leave some lithium in. So you can't kind of fully discharge or fully charge these batteries without causing irreparable damage to the, to the cell. So you have to have these kind of voltage um, systems in that regulate uh, you know, how far the battery uh, discharges and charges and, and it limits how far you can push it. Lithium iron phosphate is uh, LFP is a completely different structure. Lithium is kind of held in little tunnels inside the structures and it's called, a, it's called an olivine structure. And uh, very stable, 
uh, you can pull all the lithium out, put all the lithium back in and, the, and everything stays really, really stable. Uh, it's a very safe material, it's very cheap. And um, so, um, so it has a different set of properties when you build it into the battery. And then the, the LNMO or the spinel has no cobalt in it. And it's a three dimensional structure. And because it has no cobalt and mostly manganese, it's really inexpensive, but it's got a three dimensional structure. That means lithium can, can go in from all directions. It doesn't hold as much lithium as the layered materials, but it's very fast charging and high voltage. So it has some efficiencies that are related to that. The, 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 the end use applications are what, what really kind of are interesting. So the layered, the NMC materials are these, you know, they pack a lot of lithium in and they are suitable to long range, uh, high energy density applications. The LFP materials tend to be um, uh, targeted towards um, uh, industrial applications where there's a really heavy duty cycle. You're fully charging and discharging the battery every day and you need it to last five, 10 years. Um, that's very different than a, than a consumer vehicle. Um, you know, you're, most people drive 50 kilometers a day. And if it's got a four or 500 kilometer range, that means you're really effectively only charging it every 10 days. Yeah. And um, so the duty cycle is very low on that battery. Um, LFP has very, uh, very good duty cycle properties. So it's good for industrial applications, forklifts, um, for, uh, uh, for buses, um, fleet vehicle applications as a, um, as a substitute for um, uh, lead acid batteries where the, the, you know, the battery is getting charged and discharged on a really heavy duty cycle. So, uh, and, and it's certainly very, it's very cheap. Uh, the input materials, the iron and the phosphorus are, 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 are really low cost and, and it can cycle many, many, many times. So it, uh, it tends to provide the lowest cost of ownership over the lifetime of the battery. And, and so that has, that, that has, is very attractive to the industrial, uh, in the, the industrial part of the, of the storage industry, because they're looking to you know, amortize the cost of that battery over its total lifetime. Uh, it's very different than the, than the automotive sector who are selling you a warranty and you're paying a, a premium for the for the badge on the car and you're willing to pay for a big battery uh, for that one day you go up to whistler you know every uh, uh every every month or something like that so it, it, it kind of very very different sort of use cases and as a result the chemistry served different purposes and then and then lastly the nmc the the, the cobalt free spinel material lnmo its applications um, would be in kind of fast charging applications and solid state battery applications where, um, where that kind of three-dimensional structure provides a rigidity inside the battery that um, uh, the interface is very well with all the other solid components in, in the, uh, inside the battery. Would, would car companies or any kind of larger battery system maybe have a hybrid type where they have some um, NMC and some LFP so that they, the high frequency use that won't, wouldn't get used up. And then if you want to accelerate fast, use the LM, LNMO to, to, for the highest discharge and sort of have a hybrid system with a complex battery management system? Or? Well, I, I, th I think to, to some degree, most electric cars already kind of have a hybridized system. They actually have lead, many of them have lead acid batteries and they're running all your sort of, uh, your, sort of your dashboarding electronics and stuff like that. And, um, um, but it's a very, very small component. It's not driving your system. Um, I, I think there's a possibility that you'll, you'll get hybridized systems that um, can address the kind of needs you, you, uh, uh, you're talking about. But by and large, in, in an electric vehicle, um, it's such a massive battery and because you're looking, you, you're, you want that range that the, the duty cycle and really the, even the charge and discharge rates are very low. So, uh, because the battery is really huge, when you, even when you slam on the brakes or you or you pound the accelerator, the the, the charge and discharge rates aren't that high um, because you're 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 sucking all that energy out of a very large pool of of of, uh, of, uh, of stored energy. You're sucking that power. So, so um, really, the hybridization of that will probably be more, more when you get into constrained battery systems where you're making the battery much smaller. Let's say for low cost entry level vehicles. Yeah. And um, where, um, where you no longer have this massive battery, a massive energy pool to pull from, but you have, uh, you have this kind of constraint. So it, it might make sense to hybridize it in, in a case like that. 
but I think we'll see um, all kinds of uh, varieties kind of moving forward. And all three of these battery materials are going to play an important part in the electric vehicle space, be it the kind of long range luxury electric vehicles, um, mid range kind of mass market and entry level uh, uh, sort of uh, short range uh, um, uh, commuter vehicles. Um, those all will use different chemistries because they, uh, they bring different economics to the, uh, to the table. With the, the cost of batteries, the materials cost of the lithium or the cobalt or the manganese or whatever, is that a material part of the cost? So if the price of lithium doubles, does that big impact or is it so much more of the cost in, in the, the, the power and the engineering and, and all the sort of value added uh, processes that go into those uh, materials. Uh, listen, the, 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 ultimately the cost of the battery is, is influenced um, in a reasonable, uh, reasonably large way by the, by those input materials. Okay. The, you know, the lithium, the lithium nickel manganese cobalt uh, comprise in a cathode comprise, maybe it could be 75, 80% of the cost of making that cathode materials, just the inputs. And then, and then when you build that into a cell, uh, an individual cell, it could be, uh, could be 30, 40, uh, even 50% of the cost of the cell is that are those input materials. And then, um, and then, uh, and then when you assemble all that into a pack, you might have that down to 25%. So it, it can be, it's a pretty significant component of the, of the total pack is the, uh, is the raw materials that go into the cathode. Okay. Uh, you recently had a news release um, with a partnership with University of Michigan and solid state batteries. Did yeah. you talk it like is that that sounds a little more future, uh, not not the sort of this generation? Yeah, concept. yeah, for sure. Look, it's, it's an academic um, uh, program. Um, uh, Rick Lane, who uh, who's a professor running that program, um, is uh, has developed a way to make these uh, solid state lithium ion batteries using uh, actually using uh, um, agriculturally sourced um, uh, materials, which basically means that they have a uh, carbon neutral footprint. So all of the materials that he's using um, um, in, the, in the sort of electrolyte that he's designed are all uh, sort of carbon neutral materials. And, and basically what they've done is they take an R-cathode material and this electrolyte and they, they blend them into this, into this kind of mixed powder um, and, uh, and then fuse it to uh, uh, to the um, fuse them together, um, uh, add another layer of his electrolyte on, and, and sandwich it all together into uh, into a solid state battery, and that allows lithium to go in and out of the cathode and over to the anode, back and forth without going through a liquid, but rather going through a solid material, and so it, it eliminates the um, the risk of having a flammable um, liquid in there, and it also provides a sort of high rate of discharge, and, and ultimately might enable a lithium anode and an ultra thin uh, ultra thin and and uh, high density uh, lithium ion battery. Uh, our materials are, are particularly well suited to that kind of a design because you have to mix our powders in with this other powder and you've got to make a, and you've, and you've got to get everything really, really homogeneously mixed so that lithium could go in and out uh, effectively. It, lithium travels much more easily in, in a liquid than it does in a solid. So there are very few solids that will allow that tr transmission of lithium. And, and he's found one that, uh, as I say, is kind of organically based. And this solid state battery, is that like five, 10 year kind of timeline where maybe it could make a commercial impact or? or yeah, well, look, his is, his is an acad in, at an academic stage right now when we are yeah. working uh, with other solid state battery developers that are much closer to the commercialization. They're in that kind of pre-commercialization stage. It's well out of uh, uh, the academic stage and moving towards uh, more rapidly towards uh, sort of commercial batteries. And, and so we, we, we have test programs underway, of course, at the university level with, with people like Rick. Um, and we also have programs underway uh, with uh, solid state battery companies um, that are, are trying to commercialize their technologies. And also with some of the large automotive companies who uh, have their own programs underway and are also working um, in, in, let's say, in a, in a, in a three-way kind of arrangement with us and, their, uh, and, and uh, some other sort of startups in a solid state space. So... Okay. Uh, there's a full range of different uh, kind of companies we're working with. And, and most of these solid state companies, solid state battery companies have invented an electrolyte. 
and and then they have to figure out how to combine it with the the cathode and merge it with the anode uh, and and basically they have to design a whole new cell around their electrolyte and uh, as a result um, there's a lot of manufacturing challenges there's a lot of interfacial um, uh, challenges between all these solid materials that has to be resolved and as a result um, you know it's it's uh, the wide scale adoption of solid state batteries um, in, into you know massive battery uh, packs like you'd see in a car is, is many years out. We were more likely to see them in in uh, entry level applications like drones and and um, uh, 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 markets where uh, where the the they can command a premium for the battery. Uh, they can justify the extra sort of costs of early stage manufacturing. Um, and so we're maybe in aerospace applications, perhaps in military sort of applications and uh, drones and, and, and other consumer electronics. And as the, as the manufacturing know-how gets better and better and the costs come down in manufacturing these cells, then we'll start to see them emerge in uh, larger scale formats, particularly for, uh, uh, for automotive applications. All right. You uh, mentioned within the whole battery supply chain, you could be disrupting some of this stuff. And you've recently announced um, a deal with uh, in Chile with um, developing technology, some infrastructure down there with they, they have the, their massive lithium deposits. Can you talk about exactly what you're doing and, and how that, that, that work is going? Well, listen, that, that kind of plays into our um, the, the advantage that our one pot process brings to the table. So I mentioned earlier that, that the one pot process uh, well, we, we've actually adapted our one pot process to use um, lithium carbonate as, as a feedstock as opposed to lithium hydroxide. And that eliminates the need to convert lithium carbonate to lithium hydroxide. So there's a cost saving there. And that's very attractive to the, to the Chilean miners um, um, because um, really their first commercially viable product out of a lithium mine in Chile, which is out of, out of these brine sources, is lithium carbonate. It, they they concentrate the lithium in these in these brine pools uh, using solar evaporation into lithium chloride down to about six percent lithium chloride, and then they convert that into lithium carbonate. And, uh, and and in today's world, they're having to convert it to lithium hydroxide to get it um, into the lithium ion battery supply chain. We have a way of going directly from lithium carbonate that um, brings a lot of value to the lithium miners in Chile, and is uh, is a reason the Chilean government. Um, uh, um, uh, well, uh, is, is attracted to, to the proposal we put together um, to, uh, to uh, demonstrate this and pilot it in their Clean Technology Institute in, uh, in Antofagasta, Chile. And so uh, we're at the early stages of this. The, the company that's going to be building that facility and, and uh, managing um, it is called AUI, Associated Universities, Inc., out of, uh, out of Washington, D.C., uh, they built um, uh, a huge number of the national labs and university labs kind of around the world. And, and they won the contract to build this thing for, uh, for the Chilean government. And uh, we were part of their, uh, we were one of the projects in their winning bid. And uh, the dust hasn't totally settled on how this is all going to play out. But uh, ultimately, we're going to build a, a lab and a, and a pilot facility down there to demonstrate that lithium carbonate can be used directly in the formation of cathode materials. All right. And, and uh well, if I, if, I, if I might just add to that, yeah, the, the other components, of course, that go into the cathode material, the nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And, and in today's uh, world, though, they all have to be converted into a sulfate um, uh, prior to going into the battery, prior to going into a cathode material. So nickel um, has to be uh, dissolved. Nickel metal has to be dissolved in sulfuric acid and boiled away uh, in what's called a crystallizer uh, with a lot of energy and a big carbon footprint to make uh, nickel sulfate powder. And the same goes with cobalt and the same goes with manganese. Um, um, and uh, that uh, there's, a, there's a cost and an energy footprint associated with that. And then if you have to ship those materials, the sulfate around the world, it's got about seven or eight water molecules attached to every nickel atom. And uh, that adds uh, that adds weight and a significant sort of carbon footprint uh, to it as well. And there's a water usage issue um, because you're shipping all this kind of water around the world. Uh, the first thing that happens when I get to the to the to the the converter on the other end of the uh, 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 at, at the other end is they take the sources of nickel, manganese, and cobalt. They combine them all in a process. All of that sulfate and all that water comes out as waste, and it either has to be um, 
it usually has if they're gonna if they're gonna waste it if they're gonna put it into a landfill they have to dilute it with even more water and 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 landfill it and then the reaction itself uh, that they're using uses about 20 times more water than than we use plus they've got all this water that's going to waste plus they got all this dilution dilutive water so um we have this um a, a sort of ability to avoid that whole sulfating step because we can go directly from nickel so much like the lithium carbonate story it has great value to the miners because um, but because they don't have to give away their premium to this converter who has to convert it into sulfate and you don't have the sulfate and water waste stream uh, uh, when it starts to be converted into a cathode as well. All right, interesting. Um, you going more into your on the business development side, you, you've announced that by the end of 2022, I believe you hope to have sort of a pilot production commercial production facility up and running with a bit of revenue starting uh, at that point. Um, what is, can you just sort of talk about what you, sort of what you hope to be, where you hope to be at that point and sort of the path that goes to there, what kind of hurdles and so forth you need to overcome to get there? Yeah, look, listen, that, that's an ambitious goal, but it's certainly within reason that we can, we can, we can hit it. We have uh, one of our partners that we're working with. Uh, we've made tremendous um, strides uh, towards the validation of our materials and we're going through we will be stepping into a, a stage where we're doing uh, sort of sort of deep economic analysis and 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 design of a of a of, of a basically of, of a business that would uh, manufacture these materials the first thing that will happen um, um you know what we're what we're the steps that have to happen to get there are that uh, we have to validate uh, the materials we are testing and, and developing with them with their uh, customers, which would be the large Asian automotive manufacturers. When that validation comes through, that will um, uh, present an opportunity to pilot the uh, materials. And uh, we're hoping we can get there by the end of this year. Again, there's a lot of ifs there. There's a lot of validation steps. There's a lot of different parties that kind of have to come to the table. but. Um, we are largely on target and on budget and uh, and moving in, in that direction the the um, end result uh, of that uh, sort of validation as i say would probably trigger a piloting opportunity and uh, uh, we would do that um, within the facilities of our, of our cathode partner and would lead to some early stage manufacturing of uh, materials for um for probably some low volume battery manufacturing uh, with these uh, automotive and sort of consumer electronic customers that they have. And just to clarify, your, uh, your process is gonna be sort of close to or attached to the, the end battery manufacturer or will it be closer to like say where the lithium gets dug up? Where in the supply chain physically would, does it kind of make most sense for, for your production process to be? That's an interesting uh, uh, question. So, so I mean, what I'm the one I'm, I'm kind of describing right now um, can be kind of anywhere. It could be anywhere in the world. Um, uh, it would likely be at our partner's facility, uh, which would put it closer to the cell manufacturing than it would put it close uh, to, to the mining. But these guys are big metal mining traders, uh, metals traders anyway. So, uh, in, in many ways, it's, it's very sort of close and dear to heart to them as well from a uh, from a, a, a money perspective, because we can use um, metal powders and we avoid that whole sulfate step, it doesn't really matter if you're shipping a metal powder from the miner to the cathode producer, or if you co-locate your, your facility with the miner, um, you'd be shipping cathode materials out to the battery producer. In either case, it's a pure material. There's no added baggage um, and, and there's no added sort of shipping energy or, or, or carbon footprint costs um, uh, to, to locate it um, in these different areas. Ideally, I believe that it should be located closer to the cell manufacturer and because that's typically where it has happened um and that's how it's happened to date in, in the world but there's no reason we couldn't co-locate with a with a uh, um a, a miner for instance um it's certainly if the appetite was there to do that um i think uh, uh that's a possibility but it really it, it probably makes more sense to have your cathode manufacturing close to the cell production and you're pulling in your materials from all different directions kind of a you know uh, more like a it's the hub of a, of, a, of a supply chain where all these materials are coming together into one place. And your facilities, would they be like dedicated to one chemistry like the uh, LFC or the NMC in that, or could they be, okay, we're gonna do a batch of this and then do another batch of, uh, of that? 
So, so, so conceptually, yeah, you could kind of switch batches, but uh, in practice, you'd never take the you'd never take the uh, equipment down for any significant amount of time to do that because you'd have to you have to clean it all, you'd have to change all the operating parameters. There's a whole bunch of things you'd have to do to to do that, and and, and the reality is, it, it's it's uh, you're far better off just to build another line. Um, um, uh, to do uh, you know a different uh, type of material. The furnaces um, are, are different for each one of these and that's the biggest piece of capital equipment. So LFP has to be fired in a uh, oxygen free environment through the lithium iron phosphate and that's because uh, otherwise the iron just turns to rust. Um, so uh, to avoid that you uh, you have to actually cook these materials in an oxygen free environment. Uh, the high nickel NMC materials have to be fired in an oxygen rich environment. So they need a boost of oxygen to make them effective. And then the uh, LNMO materials, the, the spinels, uh, can be fired in air. And each one of those furnaces um, has, uh, is, is fired under different atmospheric conditions. So um, you would dedicate them to the, to the individual lines. Not that they couldn't be switched, but it wouldn't be easy. And, uh, and you'd, be tying up, um, you'd be tying up that line um, in, in downtime, uh, which wouldn't make any uh, sort of economic sense. Is your production going to be sort of dedicated to one client where like each recipe like one client has a slightly different ke chemistry so you do one slightly modified product or process for them and then another group you're working with you, you adjust it for the their requirements their chemistries or are you just going to have a catalog saying i'll have two tons of of this or that and and you just sort of a catalog product well, we, we're going to back up a little bit from our, into our into what our business model is so, so as a technology company we're licensed you know our 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 concept is to be licensing our manufacturing know-how our patents our you know our our engineering plans um to um uh, producers of cathode materials and that's either that's either a pure royalty play where they just use our technology and they pay us a royalty or we we work together in the form of a joint venture to share in the in the, in the profits of manufacturing and selling those materials um in in uh in each one of those it doesn't really matter in each one of those cases um when we design a line and we design the chemistry for that line it will be in all likelihood customized for the end user it'll be customized for the battery producer or the oem who might want a special mix of of some additive or a special coating uh, to go in ultimately in for the design of that battery so cathode materials tend to have this kind of one-to-one -one customized relationship it's still nickel manganese cobalt and lithium but there's a bunch of other pixie dust in there that the uh, that specked out for a particular user uh, in some cases um um, and when you're going into sort of, let's say, smaller battery producers, they're just going to want an off the shelf cathode material. And so in that case, it's not highly customized. It's just a it's a fairly um, sort of plain Jane cathode material that can that's going out to a variety of different um, uh, battery producers who will then take that powder and spread it onto a piece of foil and wrap it into a battery. But the uh, the large battery manufacturers, cell manufacturers and OEMs who are driving them are largely going to spec the chemistry and that requires some a sort of a customization and probably dedic even dedicated lines um, to uh, to make some of those materials. You're working with some really big global companies right now. You've got your IP, they've got yours, you're working together. That must be a, an interesting situation. And then at the same time, when you're working together, I presume you're creating IP together. How do you sort of figure out who owns what and and like the when you learn something from client a are you able to apply that to client b and and because i'm sure i you've got a room full of contracts and that they're pretty thick i'm guessing yeah we you have to put up some fairly strong walls and you have to carve out um uh, any any kind of ideas that are are are, uh, are arising uh, any kind of ideas or intellectual property that arises out of that relationship have to be dealt with um, in through contractual means and that's what a that's a, basically what a joint development agreement is it's yeah. how do you deal with that arise those arising um, uh, bits of intellectual property in our case anything that arises out of it is going to depend on, on our core technology which we own outside of those walls yeah. so we own the, our one pot process is the basis of that, that technology. And we can use that one pot process with any one of our customers, with any one of our clients. Yeah. Um, but um, we'll customize that within the, uh, the framework of that joint development agreement. And if any new IP or patents or trade secrets or know-how comes out of that, um, it is it, uh, the ownership of that intellectual property um, is dealt with under the framework of that joint development. Agreement. And each, each one's different. So in yeah. some cases, 
um, some cases you was the one one of the parties owns it and the other party gets rights to use it. So you you both end up with the same rights in the end, but you've got one owner and one uh, one kind of royalty free licensee of it. And then what that does is that that removes all the complications related to to filing the patents, paying for the patents, prosecuting the patents, defending the patents. It all goes to one player. As soon as you have two players doing that, um, you can run into all kinds of conflict. So typically, we try to structure these things so that the uh, the ownership structure is really well understood. Uh, there's a strong dividing line, but both parties get access to any of that kind of arising IP. In our case, um, we want that arising IP always to be dependent on our background intellectual property because at the end of the day, that's where the value is because we own that and that's the thing we're going to license to the uh, to the to the either to the joint venture or to the to the licensing party. That's going to be tough for the scientists and the engineers. They're working on something with one of your your partners and they learn something and then oh we can't use this kind of knowledge for these guys because they kind of own it. But once you know it, it's hard to sort of not know it to unknow it yes um uh, it's very difficult and i look that's part of um uh that's part of making sure that uh we going into these agreements we've clearly um uh we've clearly taken all of the learnings up to that point and and put a fence around them uh ring fence them for our purposes and and to use with kind of anyone the uh, the learnings that come out of it um uh there's some more uh, sort of procedural learnings that uh, that are probably transferable, but um, uh, if it's related to chemistry and tweaks, um, it's going to be very specific to the chemistry we're working with on that customer. And even though there might be some relevance to the other uh, to other parties, it, because it's specific to a certain chemistry and a certain uh, a certain variation of that chemistry, it's actually not that hard to keep it um, keep it. Um, uh, uh, again, to use the word ring fence, ring fence for that customer and for that for the product that we're we're trying to uh, make uh, using our one pot process for them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's switching more to sort of Nano One, the business, the the company side. When I first met you guys, I don't know four or five years ago, you had a relatively small facility, a handful of guys. You, you've got a history of working with like Creo, growing from small to big, being acquired by Kodak, and that. Can you talk about? The, the business what are the challenges of like how many employees do you have right now and um and, and talk about what what the the nano one corporation looks like right now yeah um we're sitting somewhere uh, around 35 employees and then we have a, a few contractors on top of that um i think managing growth is always a big challenge um and managing the uh uh you know as as we gain uh, traction in the market and our uh, sort of credibility goes up and up. We are also seeing more and more sort of incoming uh, strategic interests in what we're doing. Um, I think one of the hardest things to do is really to characterize those. And, and ultimately, we're going to get to the point where we're going to have to make some choices on who we work with and who we don't work with um, in terms of the value they bring to the table. But I, I would say those are the those are really the two biggest challenges is 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 um, uh, on the on the on the on the the business development front is nurturing these relationships and turning them some into something meaningful, incredible um, uh, to us, uh, into something definitive. Um, and uh, we continue to work on that. We're getting closer and closer on on many fronts. And then, but to do that uh, with a number of parties and control the growth within the company. So how do you, how do you do that? And, and then also, you know, bring in new people. How do you find the talent um, to uh, to backstop um, some of these uh, agreements, some of the work we're doing um, on those fronts? And can we continue to grow a bunch of these opportunities in parallel? Or at some point, are we going to have to say, okay, enough's enough. We're going to we're going to trim this down. We're going to concentrate on the ones here that have the best best chance of success. Yeah. And so far, you haven't done any sort of exclusivities where someone has bought the rights for maybe an exclusive chemistry or a market or anything like that. You, you're still. No. Uh, so there's no we're not we have no exclusivity with anyone. We're kind of free agents um, on, on all regards, except related to that. Any jointly developed ideas and, and intellectual yeah. property, of course, that that comes under the the uh, um, uh, the partnership agreements we have. Um, so in, in in those cases, you know, whatever comes out of those, um, whatever comes out of those arrangements is largely going to be focused on on the commercial opportunities uh, with that partner. Um, uh, often there's there's um, 
there are ways to to take some of that technology and use it external from the partnership but uh, usually those are those are kind of um kind of extreme cases um uh, we have to plan for them but uh, but by and large um we're we're relatively well protected and rel relatively well uh uh I, I think divided out in terms of the, the partnerships and the various chemistries we're working on. Sorry, did that answer the question properly? I I, I think oh. so. It was yeah. Okay. There, there's a lot there. Um, you've just recently raised almost thirty million dollars. You've raised a bunch of money before that. Could you just talk about the balance sheet, your burn rate? Like uh, you 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 got a lot of cash in your jeans, so to speak. Uh, a lot you could do. Your burn rate's not excessive right now. I at the end of last year, it sounded like looked like you're burning four or 500 or investing and spending four or 500 grand a month. Um, just sort of elaborate on, on what you've yeah. got, what you're planning on. Yeah. Uh, listen, our, our treasury now is kind of um, uh, it's over $60 million in, in treasury right now. And um, I, you know, before our last financing, um, the way we kind of looked at it is, is we had a kind of a three to four year runway with the treasury we had but we are accelerating activities. So the burn rate might've been, as you say, kind of in that kind of $5 million kind of range, uh, $6 million range. Um, we think it'll, it'll, it'll grow, uh, not to an uh, extreme amount, but we're trying to, we're trying to bring in talent. Uh, you got to pay for talent. Uh, we're trying to put more boots on the ground to, uh, to man all these different um, projects. And, and we've had to expand our facilities and put, uh, put more sort of piloting type of um, operations, uh, piloting equipment in place. So it's it's grown a lot since you were last there and we've tripled our yeah. footprint um, uh, and uh, doubled our laboratory space. Uh, probably we will we will have tripled our or we've tripled our battery or quadrupled our battery testing capacity uh, probably from when you last saw maybe even more than that. Um, and so all of that um, all of that funding kind of was largely in place before this last financing. And this last financing, what it really allows us to do is now to start um, exploring um, piloting and uh, uh, manufacturing initiatives you know, outside of Burnaby, <laughs> you know, uh, be it in uh, be it in Canada, more, more domestically in Canada or the U.S., or or looking at uh, international jurisdictions, um, uh, let's say in in, in Europe or. Um, Japan, China, Korea, uh, or possibly some of the uh, the more sort of active raw material um, uh, regions like uh, like Australia you know, or northern Canada or you know northeastern Canada or or uh, as we're doing in Chile and Antofagasta, um, you know obviously there's a there's an opportunity to build down there as well. So this capital allows us to kind of um, uh, I think pursue those opportunities more actively. But one of the things that's really interesting, and, and I mentioned I kind of alluded to this earlier. The auto manufacturers are really starting to think heavily about how to integrate cells into the frame of the car, how to how to go directly from a cell to the frame of the vehicle. And in doing so, they have to really start to think about the chemistry and the cathode materials that go into it. So the design of the cathode materials becomes very important in that step. And as a result, in the last six months, we've seen a, an uptick in interest from the auto manufacturers in supporting some kind of, uh, sort of let's call it, piloting activities, um, some uh, a, a way to really kind of jumpstart their next generation batteries. And, um, and we're seeing the same thing from the miners uh, for the for the reasons I, I spoke about before. And so the 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 collaborative opportunities here to work with either end of the supply chain to change what happens in the middle of the supply chain midstream um, um, uh, is, is becoming a really important uh, strategic and, and tactical approach that we're taking. How do we create a credible threat in the marketplace, leveraging the, the, the uh, really the, the, the will of the OEMs and the aspirations of the miners um, to, to change that supply chain? And this capital that we have uh, recently put in place uh, puts us in a much better position to sort of execute on that. Okay. Can you talk about the competition or what, like there, there have to be in Japan, Korea, China, the US, Europe, all sorts of laboratories working on all sorts of stuff, current generation, next generation, a lot of secrecy there. Uh, I don't know. What can you tell us what's going on uh, in, in the, in the competitive space? Yeah. So um I think I, I, what I can tell you about is some of the, the, the larger trends that we've seen. So yeah. we, 
the, the, the cathode world is largely entrenched in a very specific way. So sulfate input materials going into what we call a precursor. So you mix the nickel, manganese, and cobalt together using um, uh, um, uh, nickel, manganese, and cobalt in the form of a sulfate as, as your feedstock. And lithium hydroxide coming in uh, later on uh, when you dry the nickel, manganese, and cobalt powders um, to make it into a cathode material. And, and so we've seen... Um, we see refinements, we see improvements, we see uh, manufacturing efficiencies coming to that marketplace. And we see a lot of playing around with the supply chain. Well, how do we, maybe we should be buying nickel metal and dissolving it into sulfate at the, the cathode plant. Maybe we should be buying sulfates. Maybe we should be buying MHP from Indonesia. And so there's a lot of sort of gamesmanship going on in the supply chain to try and drive down costs. Do we co-locate the this precursor plant, let's say at the at the nickel refiner, like BASF and uh, Nornickel have done in northern Finland. Um, um, do we uh, do? Uh, you saw you you saw uh, Tesla announcing um, lithium hydroxide conversion plants um, uh, that they want to put in place in Texas to uh, convert carbonate to hydroxide. Um, and all of these are, are really aimed at, uh, at mass manufacturing, but they're all focused on this simple, um, uh, uh, without, they're all focused on the, uh, on the incumbent process of making nickel, manganese, and cobalt precursor from sulfates and bringing in lithium hydroxide afterwards. And there's no one um, really out sort of commercially driving what we're doing, which is how do you make, how do you combine the lithium, the nickel, the magnesium, and cobalt and get rid of all those conversion steps up front to drive down the costs, simplify things and, uh, and improve the sort of overall environmental footprint. So we stand alone uh, really in that regard and, um, and, and are highly differentiated in that way. But as I said at the outset of this conversation, there's lots of challenges in doing so because you're, we're trying to change the way the way we're trying to change the way the world makes cathode materials, and um, it uh, it can't be done alone. It's got to be done as a village, as a as a as a consortium, as a uh, uh, as an e sort of ecosystem. So we're drawing in players from up and down the supply chain to sort of back that effort. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're coming up on uh, almost an hour here. Um, what, uh, so I'll try wrapping this up here shortly. What sort of news or, or um, a milestone should investors uh, expect over the coming, I don't know, six or 12 months? W what kind of news should we expect coming out in Nano One? We're, we're going to add. We're going to add more partnerships, and um, we've got a lot of stuff brewing right now. That's very exciting for us, um, um, and that'll be up and down the supply chain: auto manufacturers, uh, chemical cathode producers, and, and miners. Um, so that uh, we're looking forward to bringing uh, some of those uh, budding partnerships to fruition. And uh, and, and I, you know, they're 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 big names and uh, in the space they're they're multinational players and 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 are going to be very significant partners for us so that's um uh those are those are some i think some big needle movers and then um and then uh, you know the existing uh, relationships we have are are moving along um some of them faster than others but um uh, progress on those and announcements uh, uh on that progress i think will give you know closer and closer sight lines towards um the commercialization of our technology and the adoption of our technology for the production of cathode materials there'll be more patents of course um and um and i think uh, there'll be some interesting uh, opportunities i think on the on the piloting front in various sort of jurisdictions around the world as well but that'll that'll be part and parcel to some of the partnerships that we're uh, we're hoping to bring to the table you're still listed on the the venture exchange you are you've got a big market cap you've got lots of cash on the on the balance sheet going forward it like make go to the tsx or like a lot of companies are going down nasdaq now there's a good pathway there you you've got the cash you've got more sophistication any yeah. guidance or indication you can give on on sort of that future? Like all those things to be considered, and 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 we kind of talk about we talk about on a regular basis, and we have dialogue underway um, uh, on on both fronts um, in moving that direction. We haven't pulled the pin and made the made any definitive decisions, but um, um, everything everything is kind of on the table in that regard. All right, I've got a few uh, questions here from the audience, so I'm going to read some of them out here. Um, your process sounds nearly identical to what Elon Musk talked about on Battery Day. 
are you working with Tesla? <laughs> so are, well, these... Of course, we, we haven't disclosed anything, so I can't uh, I can't answer that question. Um, uh, in terms of what Elon Musk announced on Battery Day, um, he said very little other than um, uh, we're using less water. Um, that's basically all he said uh, about cathode production. Um, um, and I uh, I think the approach is very similar. We're trying to remove um, uh, we're trying to remove sulfate. Uh, we're trying to reduce the amount of water being used and improve the environmental footprint, the cost and the complexity in the supply chain by changing the way cathode materials are made. All right. And uh, I think you addressed this before, but um, can you use nickel sulfate or does it have to be nickel metal uh, to work in, in your system? So our, our system, um, we... Uh, uh, we can't use nickel sulfate. It, it, it should be, it, it's important to understand that in the existing process, they use nickel sulfate only as a carrier. So you bring nickel, manganese, cobalt sulfate, all goes into a reactor, all the sulfate comes out. You cannot have um, um, uh, sulfate in, or you can't have sulfur in the battery uh, when it's made. It has to come out, it has to be taken out of the system. So the, 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 the precursor is a nickel, manganese, cobalt hydroxide or carbonate at that point before it gets mixed with the lithium. In our case, um, we can use, um, because we go direct in, we mix it directly in with the lithium, um, we can use nickel metal, we can use nickel carbonate, we can use nickel hydroxide, we could use acetate, we could use nitrate, anything that will burn off in the furnace and not leave a residue a material. Um, sulfate would leave a residue, um, uh, would leave sulfur as a, as a, as a residue and that um, would kill the battery. So um, that's not a, uh, 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 so that doesn't kind of fit in our process. All right. And then the final question here is talking about the royalties. Is there any indication you can give on like what percentage of royalty or the, the questions framed as like how much could you earn per vehicle um, that, that's produced or any sort of guidelines on sort of royalty rates or? Oh yeah, you know what? I'm gonna have a hard time bringing that per vehicle number to my head right now. Um, uh, but the the in terms of the in terms of the rates, I mean, we it, the royalty rate will be based on the benefit that we bring to the table. So if, if we can bring a if we can bring a fifteen percent cost reduction, for instance, to the table in cathode material, that goes directly to the to the to the margins. So that might expand the margins from fifteen percent to thirty. Yeah. And in doing so, um, uh, we would um, uh, and notionally we've discussed this with a number of our partners. We would notionally want to see. Um, a, a portion of that benefit coming back to us. If we call it a third of that, we would end up then getting you know five percent back as a as a royalty. So five percent of the production of the cathode material will come back to us as a royalty, um, yeah. and then the the uh, uh, you know the, the the licensee would take that remaining ten percent and uh, uh, and do what they do with it. They maybe they give five percent away to their customer and keep five percent for themselves. Yeah. So that that's notionally how we see the see the royalty um, uh, sort of playing out. And and so, you know, ideally, we want to be in that kind of 10 to 25 percent um, savings range because that uh, that will create a, a, a sizable royalty for us. Um, it could um, also lead to a, a, a joint venture where we would be licensing our technology into um, a, a joint venture company, which we would play a, a role in. And um, and there we wouldn't we wouldn't be picking a royalty out of it. We would be getting um, uh, a share of the profits and selling the materials, a uh, much larger share. Um, but of course, there'd be more cost associated with that as well. Yeah, and I will do one final question here. What are the major ri uh, risks or threats to your business? I guess sort of what keeps you up at night with um, that could go wrong or uh, challenges. Well, listen. I, as I said uh, at the outset, it's um, uh, it's not an easy task we've undertaken to change the supply chain, um, and I think, uh, and there are many different approaches um, uh, that we're seeing out there to try and reduce costs. So one way to get rid of you know shipping metal sulfate around the world is is to, to ship the nickel metal to a to a cathode producer, dissolve it there into sulfuric acid. You still have the waste stream, and you still have to do you still have to have all this sort of conversion processing up front, but you uh, you can eliminate some of that cost. And we already see that happening in different places in the world. Um, um, but so uh, we still uh, believe we have a strong economic um, uh, advantage over that. But the momentum behind these things is difficult to shift and change. And um, uh, as Nano One, um, 
it's very difficult to do it on our own. So forming those partnerships to us is really, really key. Developing those partnerships and getting the automotive and the miners and the and the and these other companies across the line to make that change is really the the single biggest imperative we have. And that's that's what keeps me, I would say that's what keeps me up at night is those relationships, is making sure they're moving forward and that we're uh, we're going through all the the long validation cycles in, in, a, in an efficient way as possible. And I guess just a final on sort of more uh, almost personal note, like over your journey here with Nano One, what would have been the biggest surprises? Did you think it was going to go faster? Are you surprised how long it takes to work with these large corporations or just the R&D challenges? Any sort of big surprises uh, that you've learned along the way? I think they're they're kind of more like slow surprises more than anything else. It, it's you know look the sales cycle's long, the validation cycle is long. Um, we're, you know we're midstream. You have to make a cathode material, prove it internally. Um, you go through a whole bunch of steps. There's lots of hiccups always, and then you have to go do that with your partner, and then they have hiccups as well, and you have to kind of iterate on that, and they send it out to their customers, and the same thing happens again. And uh, so those are just there's just long long design cycles. And I think, uh, you know, we've learned a lot along the way. Um, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm continually surprised in a positive way by what my team has kind of put together and how they built a vision around uh, all the various materials, whether it's, whether, you know, we were out there trumpeting LFP when everyone said it was dying. We were talking about LNMO as a key uh, cathode material going forward uh, into the future. And, and you know, two weeks ago, uh, you know, Volkswagen gets up on the podium and says, this is going to be a really important material. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and proud of my team for really identifying these trends early on and being, uh, being thought leaders in the space. And uh, that's, uh, that to me has been probably one of the, the big. Yeah, I wouldn't say a surprise, but it's it's one it's one of the uh, uh, it's one of the things I'm, I'm I'm most proud about is our 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 ability to have have foreseen this and buck the trends and buck a lot of the, uh, um, uh, you know what's what's talked about in media and and stay staying true to our course and uh, and being right. So um, I'm, I'm that uh, that to me is. Um, I guess in a way I'm, I'm surprised we, we've done that, but we have done that. So. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, we should wrap it up here. Any final comments, anything we didn't hit upon that you want to highlight here? Um, and thank you very much for uh, taking the time with us. Oh, look, I, I really appreciate all the time you've given me and, and I'm sure uh, sure it's going to lead to more questions and, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to happy to get back with you uh, to answer some of them. So thanks a lot for you know exposing me to your, your new audience and congratulations on your, on your new gig and, and what you're putting together here. All right, thanks a lot, Dan. That was really great talking to you. Have a great day and we'll talk again soon, hopefully. Great. Cheers.